just I mean, people, there's a lot of pain out there. So if you're working with people, you hear these stories and, and, uh, I dived into the pain literature and realized that this looked very much to me like the solution, a solution, a tool to help address the opioid crisis that's killing so many Americans. And, uh, and here we are. We're about four years in with my company and we have, uh, just moved through a pre IND meeting with the FDA and, uh, we're doing preclinical animal work to kind of show the safety of our formulation. And, uh, we're very much hoping we'll be in phase uh, one trials in humans next year. Hey listeners, welcome back to third waves podcast. Today we have Dr. Jeffrey Becker, who is the chief scientific officer at Bexon biomedical with us. He has over 20 years of research and clinical experience in M. NMDA receptor pharmacology and clinical use. He was also one of the first MDs in US administrating and documenting ketamine for depression in clinics and is a world recognized speaker and expert in the clinical use of ketamine. He received his BS from UC Berkeley, an MD from UCLA, and he also maintains a clinical practice focused in functional psychiatry and novel treatment approaches to mental health challenges. Dr. Jeffrey Becker, welcome to the podcast. It's good to have you. Thank you, Paul. It's, it's fun to be here. So the space that I always like to open up with um, with people on the podcast is first just what what brings you to this work? Obviously, psychedelics are such meaningful experiences. Ketamine, I would consider when used within a certain set and setting to be psychedelic in itself. So what has drawn you into this work in, in specializing in ketamine and having been involved in this space for you know 15 plus years at this point in time? I found uh, that the psychedelics when I was an undergrad were very important uh, to kind of reorienting me towards what, uh, what I had felt like I had been losing, which was kind of a sense of uh, being able to touch deeper aspects of myself and kind of be in touch with really what felt like a connection to God um, that felt like it was kind of slipping away in early adulthood. It's very interesting to me. It felt very, uh, very specifically neurologic. It felt like I had always been able to just kind of go find it. And I was finding that it was harder. And there was this odd kind of cynicism that was setting in. And I didn't really have any way of understanding why that was where it was coming from. There, there weren't, it wasn't like I was traumatized or, you know, there was no specific reason for this. And I, I, really set about trying to understand uh, what was happening. And I ended up in the religious studies department, actually, at UC Berkeley. I studied uh, religious studies and ended up uh, with Houston Smith and his mysticism class. And he ended up becoming a mentor through the years uh, and really was someone that I could talk to about this kind of really uh, that liminal loss of that liminality where, you know, I felt like I was over, overly contained, consciousness was over contained. Um, you know, natural psychedelics that I had a chance to try were extremely helpful to me in kind of reopening up that space and, and studying in parallel, the kind of hierarchy of being that, that is kind of the core aspect of mysticism. Um, really understanding the kind of planes of existence of body, mind, spirit, soul, um, soul, spirit, actually, if you follow um, Smith's kind of paradigm, uh, really felt like a, like a synergy for me. Um, I've, I've been very uh, specific about trying to help pass on these paradigms because I think they're very important. Um, but when I got to medical school, I really wanted to work with consciousness medicine, but these were, these drugs, you know, it's a felony. Uh, it still is in a lot of circumstances. And that was not really something available uh, for me as far as the risk was concerned. Um, you know, the amount of time and energy and money and, you know, investment of spirit and becoming a doctor was, I just was not, that was too much. 
Um, I advised a lot, but I never, I've never done underground work or anything in that category, but I had a chance to try ketamine and was profoundly impressed by how gentle it was and also how different it was. Um, what a, uh, what's the word? It's, uh, it's very mysterious, ethereal. It's also very gentle and it's also very, very powerful, um, which I think is an incredible combination of properties for people that are in pain. And I sought, I set out to really understand the neurobiology because it's such a different mechanism of action than the classical psychedelics. And um, that's been a 20 year adventure. I, I, you know, we can talk a little bit about that, about the differences in the way that uh, psychedelics work versus the way that ketamine works and its effects upon the inhibitory uh, GABAergic inner neuron, that, the, the kind of inhibitory controlling mechanisms that that it, at many in in many ways kind of control what we think and keep us from thinking this and keep us from thinking that or make us think this or make us think that in some ways. Uh, so the effects upon that relationship between pyramidal cell brain activity and the GABAergic inner neuron net was, uh, I, I would call it an obsession <laughs> in the process of doing all of that. Um, I really became an expert in the NMDA receptor and, and how it works. It's very, very interesting. Became an expert also in the chandelier cell, which is kind of the ultimate arbiter of whether a, whether a pyramid cell can fire or not. And how those interactions are uh, actuating subdissociative ketamine dosing, uh, which causes this kind of bloom of consciousness, and and you know the brain moves up into high gamma, and uh, alpha and beta power are actually reduced, and delta power are actually reduced all through the whole brain, really all through the main networks, the default mode network, and executive network, and salience network. So um, I. I was able to see through all of that to how effective this would be for depression. And I started doing it. I started doing it when I talked to a num uh, a bunch of different anesthesiologists and also some neurologists who were using ketamine for pain, uh, high doses, multi-day infusions. And uh, I proposed this kind of low dosing, uh, you know, with monitoring, but very kind of careful uh, dosing and, was reassured repeatedly about the safety of what I was considering. And I started doing it and, uh, here I am. And so when was this, this was 2004. Wow. So it's pretty early. Uh, and it really had to do with, I understood the neurobiology of this so well. And I also st understood the, the pharmacology of ketamine so well. And then I got enough expert opinion about, safety that it felt it felt definitely reasonable and i found you know very quickly that you can attune to the patient you know you don't have to go all in high dose ketamine right off the bat with somebody brand new i mean if a little bit is very different than a lot and so you can kind of figure out what somebody's sensitivity is to this and and that's you know i developed over the years something called hybrid dosing where you take the target you know the theoretical target dose based on your um, you know, your intuition, the patient sensitivity, their past history, you know, where they're at, whether they're kind of like, I don't know, or whether they've done a lot of drugs and they're like, oh, I've done it before. I know what's going on, that kind of thing. And you split your dose and you give them about a third of it, kind of see, see what happens. And in about 12 to 15 minutes, you can give the next dose and then you can give the next dose. And so and kind of meter out the experience. It's very, very similar in some ways, curve wise to, uh, you know, IV infusion actually, um, with a little bit of a, you get these kind of mini peaks as well. And then you actually get to talk a little bit and grab some of the symbolism when they're coming out before the next shot. And actually it's, what's nice about that is that can, that can tell a story. You can, a lot of times you end up capturing stuff in that first experience that, you can kind of work in and there's, there's this kind of evolution of symbolism, uh, that if you didn't capture that first, that first part of a triptych, it, 
I, I feel like it's, you know, sometimes that might be information lost, opportunity lost. So, so I did that. And then over the years, I cannot tell you how often I heard from patients that their pain resolved, pain, pain syndromes, fibromyalgia, uh, pain associated with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, hmm. pain associated with, you know, slip discs or failed back syndrome. Just I, people, there's a lot of pain out there. So if you're working with people, you hear these stories and, and, uh, I dived into the pain literature and realized that this looked very much to me like the solution, a solution, a tool to help address the opioid crisis that's killing so many Americans. And, uh, and here we are. We're about four years in with my company and we have, uh, just moved through a pre IND meeting with the FDA and, uh, we're doing preclinical animal work to kind of show the safety of our formulation. And uh, we're very much hoping we'll be in phase uh, one trials in humans next year. And that's so exciting. And it's been such a, such a journey for you. And I want to spend most of the time in our podcast together talking about Bex and Biomedical, which is the company that you started and what you're doing uh, with your innovative technology and patents and, and that sort of thing. And before we get into that, I'd like to just take a second and acknowledge that you studied under Houston Smith and that many of the listeners might not know who Houston Smith is. So if you could just provide a little bit of background on Houston Smith and the the framework that he had about body, mind, soul, spirit, because I think that'll help really inform uh, the rest of our conversation around healing and pain and ketamine and, and some of these more granular topics. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, it's so dear to me, and I, I never know if people want to talk about it, but I think it's one of the more important paradigms uh, that can really uh, ground what people are experiencing and help them understand where the valence of what they're f- experiencing is located so that they can figure out how to intervene. And we, I think we make a lot of mistakes when we don't understand things in this way. But um, Houston Smith, uh, with PhD, religious studies professor, uh, he was actually emeritus at UCLA, at UC Berkeley when I was up there at the Theological Institute and was teaching, he taught, actually, uh, Introduction to Religions uh, was where I started with him. He wrote a, a very uh, appreciated text called The World's Religions that is uh, very honorable as far as the core truths that are in the different religions, how they differ, where they're, where they're similar. Uh, and, uh, his, his kind of gentle and deep respect for that aching aspect of the human being to try to understand this, these higher levels, um, I, I, I think is, it's very apparent. I think it's, uh, it still stands as one of the most powerful, uh, important books, uh, in this field. When I moved into studying with him about mysticism, uh, one of the many texts that we read was, a, was, was one of his books. It's called The Forgotten Truth. Uh, and in that, in that book, I, you know, I can, I can bring most, some of the concepts down into a kind of a single kind of concept, but it really comes down to a belief um, that I actually ascribe to 100%, um, which is that being is a dimension. And it's a dimension that's as real as time and space. And it's built in layers, layers of, ex- layers of being. And you can look at kind of the phenomena that you see in the world, you see in this existence that we're all here in, and kind of see what where this comes from. The idea is is that there's body, there's mind, there's soul, and there's spirit. And body is really in a lot of ways where medicine is Western medicine is is generally intervening. You know, we think about receptors and metabolism and molecules that are bouncing into each other and you know things that are going awry. There's stuff happening though there's being there, there's life, there's, there's some, we don't know why being exists, but it is a thing. We use the word to be all the time. And yet we barely even can say what it is. Right. Um, so 
uh, psychiatry has been kind of located in the level of mind. So, you know, what do you think? What do you feel? What is the interaction between these things? Um, there's definitely an interface between the two, but there is something different about thoughts and emotions than there is about molecules and receptors, right? And yet there's still both aspects of being. And then you've got another layer up, which is where, which is kind of soul. These words are interchangeable. And I, I, I don't, I, I try to help people not get hung up on a word. Like, does he mean we have a soul? I mean, I, you know, I, I step aside from questions like that because I just think they, they complicate things. But at the level where we're dealing with archetype, we're dealing with love, we're dealing with, with, uh, you know, things that, that can't they, they really can't be quantified. They're not, it's not a quantified thing that you're looking at. You can't say there's X units of love being expressed between this individual and that individual. We can barely even describe what love is, but we do know it's real. We know it's something that we engage. Um, and there are different forms of love as well. So it's an extremely rich, uh, rich landscape. Uh, and in some ways, the landscape gets richer and richer the higher you go. And then above this is spirit, which is really, if you look, at, I think the best way to think about spirit, it's more thinking in, in more in the Hindu model where God with qualities, sag, saguna, like basically the space where God has qualities, like when Krishna is and you know when the wars are happening the mahabharata there's there's qualities there's stuff happening right but what about nirvana where there is nothing where god is god is is only what is only described in the negative you can only say that it's not this right because it's not anything it's it's all things and it's also nothing at the same time so that's the highest level so these four layers are kind of built into the structure of the dimension of being in his thesis. And I, and his thesis is big. It's not really even his thesis. I think he did a wonderful job of putting it into words and, and getting it. I mean, it's really very powerful. It's only this big. It's one of the most important things, uh, you know, I've ever read. Um, but it, uh, I think what's, what was profound for me was that, as I dived into this, it was so obviously self-apparent that it was almost as if it was something I already knew that was true. It was like, oh, of course this is true. It's the only way it could be. It's the only thing that being can be is, is a dimension that we're, that we're interacting with. And so at the simplest level, we live at the nexus of time, space, and being. And I think that's a lot about what's happening right now in the psychedelic kind of renaissance is that we're really realizing that integration needs to happen. And I'm, I'm a big advocate for psychiatry to go both down and up to think about themselves as also needing to deal with the functional aspects of health to understand if there are nutrient deficiencies and insufficient glutathione for the brain to quench the free radicals from all that fuel burning in our brain you know, low B12 levels, things like that, that, that are addressable, but they're in the body. They're in that, they're in that plane. Right. And then the spirit, you know, is somebody soul sick is the trauma they experienced when they were in college, you know, or childhood, has it caused their, their, you know, aspects of their being and their soul to, to retreat so far that it's, they barely feel its existence. You know, we have to kind of be in contact with that. I think to feel, to feel well. So, so that's Smith. And I'm, I'm, he's, he's a very, very dear, dear human being. He passed, he passed a number of years ago. Uh, he's quite a an old age. I think he was a hundred or uh, he lived a long, uh, uh, illustrious life and was, and was quite close to the psychedelic movement in the sixties and mm -hmm. quite close to Leary and Alpert and, um, Aldous Huxley and he had a very close relationship with many of those early pioneers. Uh, and I, and I, you know, Huxley in the forties wrote a book called the perennial philosophy, which I, I, I think, I mean, I, I can only speculate, but I assume there was a lot of um, dialogue between him and Houston Smith about uh, that precise topic. 
Um, and obviously Huxley was much more of a sort of public figure and um, literati and Houston was much more of an academic, but um, the the frameworks that they landed on have been even so influential. I mean, in your journey, in my journey as well, when I first started working with psychedelics, acid and, and uh, psilocybin, and when I was 19, 20, I had grown up in a fairly traditional household, religious, then started to get into atheism, Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, and that felt empty. And then finally, through psychedelics, came to this awakening. And Huxley's perennial philosophy helped me to put parameters around that, to understand the relevance of that to religion and my upbringing. And it's, it, it really is one of those things that brings sort of peace and equanimity uh, on an internal way. That's wonderful. That's a, that's a dense text as well. I mean, you have to you have to commit to that one. He, I, you know, Huxley is always he's worth he's he's worth the time, and it's always sometimes uh, I think people walk away from it uh, being being a little bit too much. But um, no, that's it. I think you you just described it quite well. And and Houston Smith was actually very involved in the beginnings of the Peyote Church, the you know, using the Native American Church. Uh, as uh, an actual religion and that was protected under the constitution and that was really helping with the soul sick um, natives in, in this country that uh, we're trying to contend with, you know, how much loss they've experienced. And that was really what many of us don't realize is peyote was really the first psychedelic that was, um, I don't know if it was legalized necessarily, but even before LSD came on the scene in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, there was a lot of discussion around peyote and its mm-hmm. its usefulness. And then we had the mushrooms and the LSD. Mm-hmm. So um, there are accounts of peyote parties in the Roaring Twenties in New York. Oh, that's interesting. oh yeah, there's this. Uh, there was there were psychedelic. There was probably some psychedelic fuel going on. <laughs> Uh, at that time too. So absolutely. Well, <laughs> so one thing that we've learned so far from the conversation is is your expertise in ketamine. You know, as it relates to functional psychiatry, as it relates to the NMDA receptor site, and one thing you highlighted is that ketamine is actually different, quite a bit different than the classic psychedelics, and yet just as efficacious in in many cases for depression and for addiction when it's used within uh, an integrative model. Um, so sort of. I'd love if you could tie a couple things together for our audience. One, um, how is ketamine different than the classic psychedelics? And then two, why then is ketamine, going back to the body, mind, soul, spirit framework, why is ketamine a healing medicine at those different levels, if you will? I, if I if I can, I think I, I should... I should dive a little bit, hopefully in a way that's, that's, I can translate some of the mechanisms because it's kind of important to understand, you know, how it works. Um, it's, it's different than the psychedelics in that it is what we call a receptor antagonist, which means it blocks a receptor and all of the classical psychedelics, at least some portion of their activity is by, is through activating the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor. I'll get into where that's located and what that does in a second, but um, ketamine blocks the NMDA receptor uh, and it blocks it when it's open, which is important because what that means is, is that that receptor is located in a stretch of neuronal tissue that has been slightly excited, okay, has come up just enough from kind of being asleep or it, at rest to being like, hmm, something going on, okay? And what happens is, is that the receptor opens up and magnesium leaves and ketamine can get in. And what ketamine does when it gets into this receptor is it stops glutamate from attaching. And really actually it doesn't stop the glutamate per se. It stops things from being able to flow through, through the channel. When the channel opens up, it's what we call a coincidence indicator. It's, it's really the key moment when a neuron or the receptor or however you want to think about it at whatever level is noting that something important is happening. And 
calcium fluxes through. It's part of what allows something called long-term potentiation, which is the very single, you know, that's the most important inception mo uh, unit of forming memory. So it might seem weird to think, okay, well, we're giving a drug that blocks the very basis of memory formation. Why would that, why would that have an effect like it has? Well, you have to take a step deeper and understand that that excitation that I was talking about, okay, the fact that it goes to the open pore, we have neurons that are that live at a slightly more excited state and actually are less likely to have the magnesium in that pore. And so if you give ketamine at just the right dose at the subdissociative kind of dosing range, somewhere like between, depending on the person, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram to maybe one milligram per kilogram, um, somewhere in that range for any given person, a substantial portion of that ketamine will go to these particular receptors that are on these slightly excited neurons. Well, those slightly excited neurons happen to be the ones that are controlling our thinking. Okay. The, the chandelier cell or axoaxonic cell is the, is the cell I'm talking about. It, it, it's such an odd neuron that when they found it, it was almost like, what? This is not real. There's no other neuron that does this. It seemed just far-fetched that there would be a brand new neuron that does a complete, it is, behaves in a completely different way. It has a chokehold around the early axon segment of pyramid cells, and it has to let go of its inhibitory chokehold. Um, it, it turns the neurons off with, with GABA. It says, uh-uh, you're not going to think that. Uh-uh, you're not going to send that signal on. No, not that, not that, not that. And then finally it says, okay, you can, you can pass that on. Okay. These neurons actually live and talk to each other as well. So these inhibitory neurons are, um, I, you can pretty much say they are the conductor of thought at a certain level. Um, they are the, they're the ultimate arbiter of a given neuron, whether it fires and, and the fact that they talk with each other and share signaling and share information about what they're doing. And one chandelier cell can, can actually inhibit many pyramid cells. You start to see how powerful the system is. It's, it's part of what we call the GABAergic inner neuron net. It comes into uh, being, it's always there, but it becomes very important through adolescence. And it's what allows a young child who's living a little bit in a dream world. Um, I remember when I was little and I was playing on the wall with a light, with a flashlight. And for me, it was, I had, I think I had two of them even. It was like Peanuts cartoon. It was like Linus and Lucy talking to each other and this and that. And I think back to myself and I think, I didn't see Linus and Lucy on the wall. I wasn't like hallucinating, but it was pretty real. I was like, there was a thing going on, you know, I mean, what is that? Right. I mean, it's a dream world in a way. Yeah. You know? So that all coalesces out and we become much, much more serious when we hit adolescence and, and the, 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 the fine tuning of this system uh, becomes much more granular and much more important all through the twenties. It's kind of like, in some ways, we kind of think of it as being done when we're 30. Um, there's all, you can still learn new tricks, but you know, the whole old dog thing is there's some truth in it. Uh, so this system can become overwrought. It can become overly constrictive. And remember, I was talking about that thing that was happening to me in college. I was feeling it. I was feeling like, where did that, where did that sense of things go? Like it's really far now. It's, it's, I'm not able to like, just pull it in and feel it. And I really, truly really believe like, it's really a neurological process. When then, when you go up into the level of mind and spirit, we have, you know, endless poems and Shakespeare plays and, you know, just the, the pathos and ethos of this is, is played out in the humanities as well, where we lose ourselves and we have to find ourselves after individuation. And once we find ourselves after that individuation process, then we fully become integrated. We get to receive back what we had, but we lost. So I think that psychedelics and ketamine can really help with this process. Ketamine gets on to the chandelier cell, it looks preferentially. So it turns off this inhibitory tone or turns it down. You can think of it kind of like a dial. 
you know, it depends on the dose. You do it enough. Woo. I mean, you really are, there's so much disinhibition that you don't even know you're human anymore, right? A little bit, and you still have all of your biographical narrative information available to you. You still know who you are, right? But you, but things open up. Psychedelics work completely differently. They, they not complete. I mean, in the end, there is an increase in signal uh, with ketamine, but ketamine is like opening up an aperture. So more light can come through the aperture, but you're not necessarily strongly increasing the amount of light available. There is a little bit of an increase in the light available. I don't want to misspeak. There's a little, it's a little complicated. There is probably some glutaminergic activity on amper receptors on pyramid cells. So I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak, but for our purposes, it's about opening the aperture. Um, the psychedelics attach to the 5H2A receptor, which are very densely located on the, on where, where all the dendrites are coming in to the pyramid cell kind of right towards the end, right above the cell body, right? Where all the information is starting to just finally coalesce and come into the cell body. Tons and tons of these receptors located there. And what happens when a classical psychedelic that attaches this receptor activates the receptor, it causes the neuron to be more likely to fire. It basically, in, it stimulates the neurons and causes them to push harder on the chandelier cell and the GABAergic neuron on that. So this model is more like uh, increasing the pressure, but not increasing the aperture. So now you have more light, but you're pushing the light through the same size hole. So it becomes that much more intense then. Yes. And so you can imagine if you, if you might, you might conceive of that GABAergic inner neuron that as being substantially important in actuating the phenomena of ego ego super ego like you know the the aspects of like what i should be who am i what 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 is what is it that i think and do and feel and what do i not think and do and feel um psychedelics push on that system and the system kind of in some ways is intact you know we don't get we don't get inhibitory uh activity from the from the psychedelics in the gamma on that. So you kind of like you're on it, you're, you're on your own in terms of letting go. You know, that's why you got to take a deep breath and strap in and know you asked for this and, and be as gentle as possible and, you know, accept the information as it comes and, you know, to try not to get caught in swirling eddies that aren't taking you, aren't, aren't allowing you to stay in flow. So um, they're very different. Um, I think that there's something about the way that ketamine works and you can imagine this kind of like when the mice were away, when the cat's away, the mice will play. Um, so all of these neurons are now getting to talk to each other. There's, in, there's all these relationships and, and sharing of information across the brain. And we can see that in, in functional MRI. I mean, this is pretty much factual. It feels like that for patients. They feel like all kinds of aspects of their being are being incorporated and kind of all in one kind of singularity of consciousness. And to some extent, it's kind of what you see in, in, in fMRI. But that ego, that inner neuron net was not present during all of it. So it comes back online and it's kind of like, hey, wait, what? What happened? It's kind of forgotten what it was trying to do maybe, but it's also a little bit like, hmm, and I, you kind of feel like you can see that. You see after about a week or two or three, you can start to see people's old patterns start to set back in. And it's a frustration, actually, with ketamine. It's, I wish it had more staying power. That's a lot of what I've been doing over the last, you know, 10 years and in my lecturing is, and teaching is trying to help people and, and practitioners just offering tools to help grab as much material as you can and learn how to work with that material because what you're receiving is symbolism from the deep self. And if you can hold those symbols, work with them, understand what a symbol is, understand that it's, you know, it's a signpost to higher truth, to higher forms of being. It's really the architecture of soul, right? If you can hold on to that, you can, you can bring that into your life and you can see amazing things happen, but it does require a little bit more, I don't know, uh, 
if not intention, education, thoughtfulness uh, in a way, uh, you know, like a, a more of a commitment because even still today as ketamine has become, I don't know if I would go so far as to say widespread, but it's, it's definitely hitting mainstream awareness in terms of its efficacy for depression in particular. There's even a pretty strong split between those who believe that ketamine infusions are efficacious and just the ketamine infusions and those who believe much more in the cap model of preparation, experience, and integration. And I think what both of us lean more towards is the integration model that the drug itself is useful. And so much of the long-term shifts and change comes from, like you said, the integration of, of the symbol, symbolism or the integration of the truth from the deep self that then becomes, um, well, it becomes integrated. It becomes part of that new self that you've unleashed or unfolded or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that that classic hero's journey where you know we're we're kind of lost in the forest and feel forsaken. And then there's usually some kind of interaction with uh, kind of a magic, almost, you know, magical individual that kind of passes something important to, to the hero, right? And there's, there's much of that is what's going on. And if you don't notice those moments, if you don't realize there was a gift offered, um, then, you know, it can be a lost opportunity. I think the psychedelics, because the, the ego, this inner neuron net kind of gets, is forced, very clearly is forced to submit in a way. And hopefully it's easier with extra work and preparation and all of that. But um, you kind of, you're kind of going to have to go, you're going to have to let go if you're going to go in um, to, you know, a solid experience, right? And so there's something very powerful in that. I think that that's why there can be, years and years a lifetime of learning in a in a in a five hour session. I mean I can remember granular moments from experiences with mushrooms 25 years ago, you know, hour by hour, mi almost minute by minute stuff that happened and realizations and it's sort of astounding. Uh and and ketamine is not like that. It's uh it's 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 again, it's a bit frustrating. So I think it's nice that we've got both tools. They both come with, they both come with their own palette of positives and negatives, like any tool, right? And so part of then what I'm what I'm hearing from you is part of what Bexon then is doing is saying, hey, let's make that initial focus on ketamine for pain, which I want to dive into in terms of why you chose that and uh, what you're doing to address that. But what we've also talked about is that the vision for Bexon is much broader than just ketamine, um, you're really looking at these various substances and how those can be weaved into the innovation, the technology and the innovation that you're creating. So I'd love if just to start with as a, as a slight shift in our, in our conversation, just what is Bexon? Kind of what was the impetus behind Bexon? Um, and what up to this point in time has been most interesting about the work that you've been doing with Bexon? We, you know, my partner and I, Greg Peterson, you know, I was lucky enough to meet him up here where I live in Santa Barbara. And I knew very quickly when we were talking that this was someone who was quite serious and quite disciplined and very, very skilled, uh, really uh, a special set of qualities and experience uh, to kind of look at something, look at, look at really try to solve big problems. So uh, I was interested in the pharmacokinetic problems that are associated with ketamine, which is that it's got very poor bioavailability. It's, it's very, you, you, it's very hard to get proper dosing orally. You end up with a lot of extra metabolite that's unnecessary and potential mild to moderate risk. If you, if you're using it in pain management uh, in that way, and I also was interested in the problems that are associated with delivery in the mental health space as well in supervised settings. So um, we felt that the most, the biggest impact that we could make and also the most kind of careful and prudent pathway was to go towards pain first. 
Uh, pain, pain requires actually less ketamine than for depression. You're not as concerned with pushing enough drug into the bloodstream to get it through the blood brain barrier and get the effects in the brain, in the mind, you know, mind and spirit that you're looking for in depression. So it's an easier proposition because you can dose at a lower level. You can kind of justify the building of these delivery platforms, which are a lot of work and a lot of expense. And you can justify it uh, partly because we have a pain problem for treatments. And we've also got, you know, one of the worst, it's just unbelievable how bad, you know, the opioid crisis is. I mean, the number of people that are dying every year is, it's not, it's not that far off from being as lethal as World War II for, you know, the American, in the American side, um, in terms of loss of humans per year. So, uh, it, it really is a war in a way. Uh, it's, and we don't have a lot of answers. So that's why we went this direction in the, in the process of that. We've hacked a lot of the problems that would allow for really quite safe and nuanced and um, consistent dosing and supervised settings as well. So the same pump system, delivery system, subcutaneous ketamine system that we're using, we're developing for pain at lower doses for at-home use in post-operative pain management is essentially modular. Um, it can be applied for in-office use for the treatment of depression uh, as an alternative to the other routes of delivery that are out there, which I'm not arguing against. I just, uh, I think we are offering, offering a lot of solutions. Um, the interesting thing that has happened is that in the process of solving the problems regarding ketamine's basic chemistry when it's in solution, uh, we were able to raise the pH to much closer to the pH of subcutaneous tissue uh, and lower the salt content. Uh, ketamine is a little bit like, you can think of it like salty orange juice. Um, and that's not friendly to that tissue. It basically burns the tissue. You can get a sub, uh, uh, what we call a sterile abscess. It's not infected, but it, you damage the tissue enough. It hurts. It can hurt for days and weeks. Um, so it's never been a viable path, uh, route of administration. So in hacking that, we've created a new pharmaceutical excipient essentially that can be applied to other molecules that have essentially a hanging nitrogen that can be ionized. And that includes essentially um, all of the psychedelics, all of the main psychedelics, definitely the classical psychedelics and a lot of the research molecules that have been developed that are RIFs and uh, various substitutions. Um, and also a lot of the other dissociatives and the pathogens. And um, it's been a bit, honestly, it's been a bit overwhelming uh, how many ways this, uh, this technology could get applied. What we are looking at this under under Bexin, we have a program called Hermes, and what we're doing is applying our formulation technology to multiple different scaffolds to establish whether or not you know do, do these create formulations that are stable that are optimized for sub Q use. Uh, and then we are kind of looking at them and figuring out you know where where are the best efforts to uh here you know is it something we want to develop in-house is it something that we're thinking about out license um and how might it be applied with the different kind of delivery technology solutions that we're developing because this pump is one of the things that we're looking at we're also uh looking at dose metered uh pen injectors as well and those could be very helpful for reassuring the agency the fda um, that something like a microdosing model, um, is going to be used properly. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I, I tend to be, uh, I, I'm very much live and let live. I have zero, very little interest in telling other people what to do. Uh, I don't, you know, the, you can microdose right now if you want to. Uh, it's, you know, people are, and, you know, there are a lot of experts out there. There's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, what we don't have though is a way of, delivering these molecules in metered dosing that is really quite, you know, consistent, straightforward, FDA approved, and, and can protect people both from inadvertent misuse. I think people, you know, I, 
I, I speak with patients and I speak with friends and microdosing is amazing uh, for many people. And it's a little difficult to figure out uh, depending on the person. And, um, and especially if this is going to go out and be available to people that are not already with one foot in the psychonaut universe, you know, people who really don't know anything about these, um, you know, allowing them to use these and making sure that, you know, in their first journey or their first experience with maybe microdosing and LSD analog, they're, you know, they're just using six micrograms every two or three days and kind of see what happens. Let, let them work through the steps like we do with other medications. Um, so uh, that's what we're doing. And it, it's been, it's been amazing. Uh, so far we haven't found a scaffold that we haven't been able to apply this to. So it's been um, very heartening and very exciting and a bit overwhelming, but it's, it's uh it's it's a big adventure. And so for the listeners at home, how might this be applicable? Like how would a Bexin device sort of come into their lives or the lives of their loved ones? Um, you know, would it be through a psychiatrist? Would it be through a clinic? Is this something that they take home with them? Is this something that's only used, you know, within the office, so to say? What how how are you thinking about the the sort of use cases yeah. of it? That's a great question. And it gets at, I think the simplest way to understand the way we're thinking about this is that much of it, Matt, much of it centers around dosing. I mean, I, I do, I think that microdosing of there's a lot of different molecules that, that may be very valuable in mental health treatments. Uh, they may be very valuable as anti inflammatories. They may be very valuable in age associated memory loss. Uh, kind of an anti-aging technique just in general. Um, and when the dosing is low enough that we're talking about sub-threshold, you know, maybe things kind of come up a little bit, but it's very, very manageable. It's not it's not a psychedelic trip. Um, At-home use, I think, is very reasonable. I don't know that anybody could really argue against it from the perspective of the actual psychic state. Uh, there are some questions about 5-HT2B receptor activation and cardiac risk and all that. And that has to get sorted out. That's, those are big and important questions. Um, but as far as the psychic space, um, I, I, I don't see why home use would be unreasonable. Um, on the other hand, you know, a full blown DMT infusion with a subcutaneous pump that is designed to kind of come on, you know, kind of gently, but get people into the space. Um, without the need for an MAO inhibitor, uh, that's probably most, it's probably very important to have somebody there. Um, I don't think that that sure people should be necessarily doing that, you know, in their bedroom by themselves. Uh, so uh, again, I, I tend to try to just take a sidestep to these questions because we are, we're early in feasibility, really trying to figure out the way that these things can be kind of gently, effectively, and carefully introduced to society in, in, you know, uh, in an FDA approved manner, uh, to really bring all the institutions and all the institutional wisdom together, uh, for, uh, for the field. I'm not again, arguing against, you know, there's decrim movement and I am, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, not from the perspective of, uh, it being a competitive model at all, it actually comes from a different place. I really hope that we are careful about not turning it into uh, a, a serious commodity with advertisements and uh, getting people into things that they need to be a little, a little slower about. Um, I've watched what's happened in the cannabis industry in terms of taking something that, you know, is a medicine sometimes, sometimes not, but you know, all the, all the, the, the dabbing and the kids that are taking in 400 milligrams of THC a day. I, I don't think that's good for the brain. I really don't. Um, I think that that's, that's a problem. Um, and we've really enabled, uh, the, an, an extreme, extreme shift in use. Uh, and I do a lot of the work trying to get people off of these molecules, uh, when they're really stuck. So, you know, we see cannabis hyper emesis syndrome where people can't stop vomiting. When they're trying to get off of, of, you know, excessive dabbing and 
there's a lot of fallout and it's not necessarily being um, communicated to the public. I mean, you can, you can just do a Medline search on that one if you want to see. Cannabis hyper emesis syndrome. Uh, people are showing up in the ER dehydrated and, you know, with, with bleeding in their stomach because they've been vomiting for so, so much, so long. There are people that can't get out of the shower. There's something about it where when they get out of warm water, all of a sudden it comes back on and they, they like, like live in the shower. I mean, it's weird. Let's, let's avoid that. You know, let's definitely the avoid that. Like, we'll make that, we'll that. make that commitment. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was, I was talking with someone else in the space who's who's quite underground, but runs a very well respected um, place in in the the middle of the states. And he was expressing a similar concern about sort of the momentum, in particular, with decriminalization, only because um, you know you just need a few horror stories for the media to 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 turn the tide, so to say. And that's always been the concern with this. This third wave is once this sort of pops out of clinics, how do we actually create a container where it can be intentionally held? You know, I'm curious from your perspective as a as a medical doctor and you know, having been in this space for as long as you have, what are some of those downsides that you potentially foresee? And um what are you doing with Bexon in particular to to help address some of those potential downsides as this becomes more more widely used? I think, you know, as far as what we're trying to do about it, I think the carefulness and the, and the dosing control, you know, that's, that's a big part of things. I think it's, I think it will be nice when we get into a position where the question is, and should I, you know, should I have three of these caps or five of these caps or two of these stems or how strong are these and what batch do they come from? And, you know, I mean, they're amazing. I love, I mean, mushrooms have been very, very important, uh, in healing aspects of my, uh, psyche, but that's not really what you want to be doing in a medical office. Uh, so it just, it, we're just moving into a new phase where the legitimacy of these molecules is becoming established. And, and if they're going to become tools for, you know, the existing medical model, we need, we need delivery solutions that are, that are clean, effective, and consistent uh, and approved. Um, and then people can also do whatever they want in their, in their homes and on their own time. I, there's no, there's really no, it's not an either or model. Um, so that's what we're doing. That's where, that's the way we see ourselves is solving those specific problems for this particular arena. Um, I, I will say that there's, you know, I will, I will point to a cautionary tale of a patient that I have that, that is something that concerns me, which is uh, that these are extremely powerful molecules. And I don't think that it's always communicated, you know, how, you know, dark at the smoky light of, you know, Tibetan book of the dead, to use a Huxley term from heaven and hell, um, you know, what, that means and how to handle it and what it, and where to go with it and and how you know i have a patient who had had um very very effective growth phase in his life from ketamine infusions actually in another clinic and i was just helping with integration um and he'd had such good experience that he kind of thought oh you know all of these tools are available i should go and try them out right and he went and did a DMT inhaled DMT experience, uh, which is, uh, can be quite intense. And, uh, he had a, he had a reasonable first experience, but he came out of it with an enormous amount of material that he didn't know what to do with. He didn't know how to integrate all this new knowledge into his life. Um, unfortunately, when he talked to the practitioner that was doing the underground work with him, they said, oh, what you need to do is do it again. And so he went and did it again. And then he became deeply destabilized. Um, he was this close to suicide for about a week. He felt that everything that was happening around him was not real anymore, um, that there was we were living in some kind of simulation. Essentially it was, you know, quasi psychosis. Uh, it was, it was, and, but he was functional. I mean, 
So that was what was so hard was he was saying, I can get up and I can work and I can do my homework and I can get my emails out. And I feel like none of it is real. And I'm, you know, and I'm never, ever going to come back to having my feet on the ground and be able to look my daughter in the eye and know she's real. I, it was, I mean, it's real serious business. It's really, really serious business. He was absolutely deeply ashamed, ashamed to a level that he could, he could barely look at his wife because he was so embarrassed for bringing this into the family bringing this level of kind of terror that he was, was oozing out of his pores, um, into the family. And she was wonderful, loving, loving woman. And, uh, she was able to give him, she, I mean, it was very important. I mean, and, and he was very lucky, you know, that she was like that. I mean, if it could have been very different at home. Um, so he's okay. He's, 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 he's reconstituted. Um, you know, we're working through the issues. He's diving into deep spiritual texts. He's trying to understand the dark night of the soul and, you know, understand, you know, the awfulness of seeing God, you know, with un, unmitigated, unvarnished, unfiltered, you know, information. I mean, there's a reason we use the word awful. It's too much sometimes. And so I, I, that's. Oh, I had never thought of that. Thank you for. Yeah. That, yeah. That's wow. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's too much for a lot of us, uh, without preparation and without understanding what it is. So. Uh, anyway, that's one cautionary tale. I have a lot of them. I do a lot of kind of reconstructing and repairing and res- restoration after excessive psychedelic use. I know I've, I've seen what happens a lot and, uh, I would, I would just caution everybody to be very respectful of, of how serious the downsides can be. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're amazing tools, but like any tool, you know, it's quite sharp and you better know what you're doing. Yeah. And that's even something that I've spoken to again and again, even just the the relevance of microdosing and the concept that I can experience some of these benefits without having to open up myself to everything that is and ever will be. And there's there's clearly <laughs> clinical benefit from high doses of psilocybin and much of those much of that research has been done in a clinical setting so they've they've gone to incredible lengths to mitigate you know a not necessarily a challenging experience but a a a, a bad trip something where something goes awfully wrong and when we're out in the wild like the clients that you've worked with it's hard to know who to trust. It's hard to know which facilitators that you can trust. It's hard to know where they're coming from, how they've trained. And this is, this is a problem and a gap that I've also, you know, we at third wave have given significant thought to, we're, you know, rolling out a directory now of retreats, clinics, coaches, therapists, we're doing our own training for coaches. This, this really feels um, like a huge gap that we have to address if, if, decriminalization and just general sort of the mainstreaming of psychedelics is to be successful. And I feel like and the, the innovation that, that, that you're and that Bexon is doing is, is another part of that puzzle because through the technology that you're innovating, that's just another stop gap to ensure that these are used with intention, with responsibility in a way that uh, creates a, a sense of longevity you know, with, with this medicine. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I, I, and I, I do believe that this is actually is happening in many ways. I think that we've, yeah, that there's a lot of awareness of this need and, you know, your work and, uh, you know, a lot of the work out there of institutes and, and societies and groups that are very serious about helping make this happen properly. Um, I, I do a lot of warning to people about some of the rookie errors that happen when people get into the field too quickly and, you know, kind of go on the guru trip too quickly. You know, they feel like all this, all this quick, you know, it's a little bit harsh to say, but sometimes unearned knowledge comes and people need to be careful about keeping a very humble ego and not 
in the words of Edward Edinger, you know, in Ego and Archetype, really being careful about not having their ego identify with the powers of the self. When we do that, when we believe that we've captured all the powers of the self, there are fantasies of omnipotence and, and omniscience and, you know, controlling the universe and that we can do no wrong because we're so good. Um, it's a, it's a type of inflation that can be very risky to people, to individuals directly in their own lives, but it can be very, very risky to people that they work with as well. Uh, and it, and it happens, it happens a lot. And, uh, I would, you know, just encourage everybody to watch for that. We need to watch for it in ourselves. Everybody needs to be very careful here. And that in some ways that's back to the beginning of the conversation and the religious studies that you entered in Houston Smith, right? That has been the role of religion for so many years is to help the ego to recognize that it is subservient to something greater and to create rituals and traditions around that very practice. Now, obviously, there's a dark side of religion as well that we're well aware of, but just that container, those rituals, that humility that comes from um, whether you're a Christian or whether you're a Hindu or whether you're a Buddhist or whether you just have a connection to something greater, that is often the reminder because Oftentimes with these experiences with psychedelics, we lose in the trip itself, you know, 90% of the ego and, or 95% of the ego, or, you know, it has that ego dissolving property. And yet what is often the case is the ego is, let's say, anti-fragile in a way. So if you keep just five or 10 or a little bit of a round, it just gets, it, it, it can get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so that is often the case where you'll see people who will work with psychedelics who they, like you said, they think they have all this insight and wisdom and awareness. And yet it's actually a form of narcissism or spiritual bypass or um, something that, that isn't rooted in humility and, and true wisdom and honor. Yeah. And it's, you know, this is, this is, Tough stuff. I, I don't, I don't, I don't ever want to feel like a scold. You know, I, I, I think that there's so much excitement and it's all, it's, there's so much actual good that's coming as well. So I, I really don't want to be the, you know, the person that's pointing out, yeah, but don't forget this. But, um, I really think it is important that we don't forget this. Uh, it's, it's, it's all on us to do this properly. So one thing that we sort of skirted around but haven't totally dove into yet is is patents in the psychedelic space. And that's something that I wanted to talk about with you because it's a hot topic. It's one that is incredibly relevant as billions of dollars come into the space. And we've seen a range of patents. And whether or not those patents are tied to innovation is, I think, a, a big question. And it's a big sort of topic. And I'd love to just hear from your perspective and with what you're building at Bexon, why is it that you think patents are important? Why, and, and, and what particular innovation do you hope to bring to the field to grow and build and, and contribute to, to this sort of renaissance of responsible use and the clinical use and, and all that, all that sort of stuff? Mm -hmm. It's a great, no, this is, this is definitely a hot topic and it's a, um, it's a contentious one and uh, for understandable reasons. Um, we, we have an ethic at Bexton that is think I would be, I would want to be very, very clear uh, about what, where we live and how we think. Um, we have zero interest in trying to patent something that already exists. Uh, we are, we are, have zero interest in trying to kind of capture space, uh, that already exists. I, I've been in the field. Uh, for 20 years, really longer, if you think about how long, you know, going back to undergrad and uh, have deep respect for the work that's been done and the space that's been uh, opened up already and who did that and how it happened and how important those tools are. Uh, and we all own them. Uh, what we are interested in doing is protecting our ability to spend really serious money uh, developing things that don't exist yet that I believe and our company believes will solve a lot of problems for human beings in terms of application of these new tools. 
Um, we can't accept investment and spend money and spend money at the rate that you spend in pharmaceutical development without knowing that when we get to the end of our path, if we've invented something that didn't exist before, that we have the ability to make money off of it for enough time that it's worth the effort uh, as far as all of that's concerned. I don't, I don't have the capacity to raise the money that would be necessary for Bexon to develop all of this through philanthropy. It's just, it's just, there's just not enough. And I, I, or I don't have the gravitas to draw that money in, you know? Um, so that's not something that I could do. Um, we are, um, you know, very, we are, pat we have a lot of patents and patent filings and we, uh, we already have a patent on our specific formulation of ketamine for subcutaneous use. Uh, but I would be, I would be clear. Uh, we have a patent on the way that we did that. We don't have a patent on subcutaneous ketamine. You know, we also have patents that we filed on the way that we are producing our pump that has tamper resistant qualities and has qualities that will allow improvements in delivery and things like that. Those didn't exist, the things that we are patenting. And they're part of what makes the whole thing work. Uh, so um, I, I had an article I worked with Shelby uh, at uh, double blind to kind of clarify that in the patent space, I think everybody needs to remember that patents only last for so long. I mean, by the time a pharmaceutical company like us gets something that we've invented to market, we won't have more than probably anywhere from, we, we're a little bit lucky actually, because we had a lot of lead time, but we won't have more than probably 14 years uh, that, that we would have some protection. And at that point, it becomes part of the Commonwealth, essentially. Anybody can do, can use that technology for the rest of time. So there's a small little window, about 14 years. And most drugs, you only have about 11, 10 years, sometimes less. Uh, there are some patent life strategies that I would call quasi shenanigans. I mean, I, there's, there's, don't get me wrong. I, there's a lot. There's a lot that's wrong with the pharmaceutical industry. There's a lot. Um, but sometimes people don't really realize what's where where the things are wrong and where they're okay, uh, in my opinion. I mean, the patent the nuance in a way of of nuance, yeah, yeah exactly. So I you know, I I hope that people can see through to our our essential ethic and uh it feels very clear to me. I I, I really am, I don't I don't have any sense of doubt about whether what we're doing is proper. And I, I would be, I would be red in the face and absolutely wouldn't be able to show, show myself uh, if I was trying to take something that, that we hadn't invented. So, yeah. Beautiful. Well, and I think that's important because back to the word nuance, if I've learned anything these last few years, it's there, there seems to be less and less nuance in conversations. And I think this is just as true when it comes to patents in the psychedelic space. Um, and yet the, the, the number of different companies doing different things, whether it's molecules, whether it's delivery devices, whether it's clinical spaces, whether it's education and training, you know, protecting innovation is important and it's helpful and it allows us to spend the time and energy necessary to be inventive and I think you and I would both agree that while patents are necessary in the short term, our greater hope for this and it, it is for the it is for the longevity of this movement precisely for the reintegration of these substances. And we recognize that this is something that's way beyond Bex and it's way beyond an Atai. It's way beyond a third wave. It's way beyond any of these. It's 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 next 50 to 75 to 100 years. So, you know, we, we look at these from a very small scope um, because this is what's required on a monthly and, and sort of yearly basis to, to create. And uh, I think both of us understand that um, we wouldn't be doing this work if it wasn't for something much greater. And, and, and that, that's why we continue to show up and why we work the stressful hours that we do and, uh, because there's there's some, something much deeper there. It goes back to what you were seeking when you were a college student, right? 
and uh-huh. and the fact that you now get to work on a technology that's directly related to that opening that experience of of whatever's beyond is so um it's something that I'm very grateful for in my own work and I'm sure you are you are as well thank you I think that's really well said this the safe space that that creates for an inventor and entrepreneur and that kind of creative force to be uh, incubated and, and to put in, it's not, it's really, it's not just money. It's also, you know, a huge amount of time in one's life to dedicate to that could be dedicated in other places. So when you decide you're going to do that, um, it's nice to know you're safe as you're doing it. It creates, it, it creates the, it creates the container for creation in some ways. Yeah. Beautifully said. Well said. So Dr. Jeffrey Becker, Chief Scientific Officer at Bexon Biomedical. Uh, Jeff, just as a last ask, if people want to find out more about you, about Bexon, about whatever's going on, what's where, where can you point them? We have our website. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure when this will come out. We're doing a bit of rebranding. We've had so much happen in the last year and our website is so, so far behind in terms of kind of explaining who we are and where we're going. Uh, so there will be a new kind of rollout on that front. Um, there's a lot available about, about me and my orientation towards all of this and other podcasts and, and my website has some, some information. Um, and then there's a lot about Bexon. There've been a lot of, uh, articles about us that can kind of get, uh, a little deeper on both the science and the technology. And we'll provide some of those, uh, articles like the recent vice one and, and any others in the show notes as well. So if folks want to dive deeper, they can do that. So, um. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, you know, we've known each other, I think for four years now we met in, in late 2017 through a mutual friend and we had a chance to meet in LA and, uh, um, do a little work together. So it's just an honor to be able to have this conversation in public with you, uh, Jeff, and, and to, to learn at length really what Bexon is up to and how that's, um, you know, how that's been mo- motivated by your own work and, and, and everything that you've been up to. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. I really, I appreciate your work and that that means a lot to me. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit thethirdwave.co where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.